Hi, I'm Paul Feinberg. I'm here today with Associate Professor Sanjay Sood, who is also the Faculty Director of the Entertainment and Media Management Institute at UCLA Anderson. Uh, Professor Sood has written a paper about the marketing of movies and their sequels, and we're going to discuss that topic today. Sanjay, t why don't we just begin with a, a general question. What were you thinking, um, what was your goals when you began the, the project, the paper, and um, what were some of the conclusions? Well, what we're trying to do in this paper is expand the marketing research to go beyond uh, tangible products that we normally study and look at intangible uh, experiential goods that have different set of constraints and a different set of marketing issues. So uh, this is one of the early papers looking at something that's not a consumer packaged good. So um, we looked at movies. What this summer we have, um, we talked about, and you talked about sequels. This summer um, we have a number of sequels coming out. There's a new Indiana Jones film coming out, a new uh, in the Narnia series, and new James Bond later in the year, uh, or next year, uh, Harry Potter. Um, talk a little bit about how the titles of the films actually impact the way the films are marketed. So what we did in the paper is we contrasted what the traditional recommendations would be in the academic literature um, that has typically said the more similar a brand extension is to the original product, the more successful that product is going to be. And in the realm of movies and most experiential goods just kind of more generally, what we're really trying to say is that uh, people satiate on experiences and so we prefer variety, we prefer something new. And while it's better to kind of stick to your knitting in uh, product space, it might be better to add something novel. So have some sort of hybrid where it's kind of moderately dissimilar from the original so that you attract a wider audience for your sequel. So in that space, what we did is look at the title of the movies. And so sequels have generally used two types of titling strategies. One is a numbering strategy, we call it, where you have uh, movies like Spider-Man that has been Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 3. And the other we're calling a naming strategy where the uh, sequel gets named something instead of a number. So the Lord of the Rings series, Lord of the Rings, um, Return of the King, The Two Towers, that's an example where they're not, they're going away from the numbering strategy and using a naming strategy. So the kernel for the idea is that whenever you have a numbering strategy, you're really relying heavily on the original movie as a basis for evaluations. And the more that you rely on the original movie, the more it seems like it's the same old thing kind of remanufactured. So sequels are a really important uh, vehicle for the studios where it's doubled in revenues, uh, in box office revenues from uh, this decade to compared to the decade of the 90s. And when you have such important brand building um, ideas in the sequel, what you really want to do is kind of maximize the leverage in the sequel so that you can have as many sequels as possible. And what we're finding is that the numbering strategy actually limits your potential compared to the naming strategy. What were some of the films you looked at specifically? Did you analyze any particular sequels, uh, uh, series? Yeah, so we did uh, a couple of things in the, in the lab and experiments. We tested uh, a Daredevil sequel um, and a Meet the Parents sequel. And uh, in the empirical data that we had, we had uh, a database from IMDb of every sequel that's been launched uh, since the 1950s. So we analyzed both of them and the pattern was the same, both in the lab studies and in the field study where named sequels outperform numbered sequels. Why do you think that is? I think it's because the, as soon as you hear the numbering, you start to think, okay, well, I, I've kind of know this before. So in movies, when you hear, let's take uh, uh, series that have been ex extended a lot, like Friday the 13th, you know, part one, part two, part three, part four, part five, you know, it starts to get a little bit old. I think Rocky is a really good example of something like that, where you had Rocky one, Rocky two, Rocky three. 
Rocky IV, you know, nobody wanted to see Rocky V, but when he comes out and he calls it Rocky Balboa, now there's something new, it's something interesting, maybe I want to see that one as opposed to a Rocky V. Kind of the most extreme example would be James Bond, where James Bond, uh, the franchise is on something like James Bond 20 or 21, something like that. And if it, you can imagine, if it's called James Bond 21, that would, that would uh, not capture the imagination compared to a name title. It's like nobody can even remember which who Rocky fought in which Rocky right. Rocky movie. Um, are there applications for um, other types of products uh, for, for the research, um, if you were naming, I don't know, detergent or, or soap? Uh, are, there, are you looking at other types of applications? Yeah, what you see in consumer packaged goods nowadays is when, let's say, a detergent like Tide comes out. They keep the brand name Tide and it's kind of new and improved. And what we're really talking about is when uh, a product is using a numbering strategy. You find this much more common in high technology. So Intel with the Pentium chip is an example, where right now they're on Pentium 4. Are they going to do Pentium 5? Or when does it make sense to come up with a new brand name? So you sort of had this tension on the marketing side that if I keep the existing brand name, it's more efficient in terms of resources. Uh, I have to spend less of my marketing budget against that uh, existing name. And it already has a group of of consumers that really like that brand. Uh, compared to when you launch a new brand, now I have to do a major marketing push again, and it's going to cost a lot more, and I have to build up a new name. It's more risky, um, but at some point, the marginal benefits outweigh the marginal uh, costs. Um, in terms of the movie studios and, and those who make films, um, how do you think they'll, they would react, or the, how are they reacting to the information in your study? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know how widely disseminated this information gets within the entertainment industry. So what, uh, what, we've, what we're doing is we're trying to use the Entertainment Institute as a way to, to get this knowledge out there. So knowledge dissemination has been uh, kind of poor in this industry, uh, just kind of looking at what the academic frameworks are and what's actually practiced out in industry. And we're trying to bridge that gap with the Entertainment Institute. Uh, is there another uh, step in, like this was a, a beginning, a first study, is there a next step or, or are there further steps beyond that? Uh, so yeah, we're looking at the other kinds of things that may invoke the same kind of mechanisms within consumers. So we're looking at trailers and uh, when do you say from the makers of, you know, a similar movie or a dissimilar movie and how does that influence people's reactions towards the trailers? We're looking at actors as brands, so if I have Tom Cruise, how can I manage the Tom Cruise brand or the Will Smith brand and how, how broad can they go in terms of different types of movies? So all of the frameworks that have been typically applied to products can now be applied to movies or any kind of experiential good. Any, any thoughts on what you'll see? You, you, you go into it with a just an open mind on what you might see, or do you have, do you begin with um, I don't know, a theory or some conjecture on, on what you'll find, whether it's people or directors or, or the other things you're discussing? Yeah, we, we always begin with some theoretical framework that we're trying to uh, use as the basis for the study. So as I said, when you contrast products to experiential goods, you have uh, a, a fundamental difference in something that you own, you take home with you, and you kind of use on a regular basis, or something that you're going to experience in the movie theater, and it's two hours, and that's the end of it unless you buy a DVD. So when you're looking at movies, you're really looking at how does that experience impact the individual? How are they processing information about whether or not to go and spend the money on uh, a particular movie? So it's very different when you're uh, talking about a, what we're calling creative properties. So if you have intellectual property, creative properties where it's intangible and people aren't going to walk home with it, how do you entice the audience to, to get excited about a film? Tell us a little bit more about how you conducted the study. The, the film titles you used were, were not real movies, correct? There wasn't a Daredevil 2, I don't think. Um, so how did, you, how did you sit people down and, and, and do the actual nuts and bolts work? So in, in this research, we had a combination of lab studies along with uh, a real database. So in the lab studies, what we're after is tight control. So we purposely do not want to study a movie that already exists so that we can kind of create the plot, we can say what this movie is going to be like and just assess consumer reactions. 
Um, so that's what we did where we had uh, Daredevil was our movie and we used uh, two titles, Daredevil 2, uh, which was the numbered title, or Daredevil Taking It to the Streets, which was the name title. And we had the identical plot and we asked people to uh, assess their reactions of how likely they would be go to see this movie uh, just based on the title and the identical plot description. So in the lab, we can have tight control over what people are doing and uh, pretty much uh, try to tie, uh, zero in on the causality of why we're getting the differences. Uh, then contrasting it with the um, empirical work, we had a database from IMDb with several million subscribers who had put comments on every single movie sequel that it's, has existed since the 50s. and. Uh, um, we got the same sort of result where the ratings were higher for the name sequels relative to the numbered sequels and there we're talking about you know literally there's you know hundreds of sequels that have been released and we're looking at the real marketplace impact of those sequels on the uh, consumer base. So, Sanjay, how does the, the naming um, the, the naming styles apply to in the video game industry? Uh, video games are a really important industry because uh, they are attracting as much consumer attention and um, as much revenues as the movie industry these days. In fact, I, th I think the video game industry just surpassed um, the domestic box office in terms of revenues. Uh, and a good example, um, right now the best example, is Halo 3, which uh, was released uh, last year and uh, did $170 million plus on one day. So that was the best entertainment release ever, beat out Spider-Man 3, which had 151 million in its first opening weekend, and this did 170 million in one day. And uh, if you look at the titles of those properties, the, uh, it's exactly analogous to movies, where you had Halo, Halo 2, Halo 3. You can imagine if you go to Halo 4, Halo 5, at some point people, see, people are going to have this reaction that I get it, I know what that's about, versus if you named it uh, and you had, were queuing something different that's in the game itself, you might see that property live a longer life. Can you tell us a little bit more about what uh, Emmy is working on or some of their plans for the near and you know, maybe not so distant future? Uh, the Entertainment and Media Management Institute was created uh, a few years ago and what we're trying to do is uh, develop this um, base that allows academics, students, and practitioners to kind of come together and talk about the entertainment industry and the business issues that are unique to that industry. So we just discussed something that's uh, unique on the marketing side where um, you know, the sequels and the naming of the sequels impacts uh, marketplace performance. But you can look at other aspects of the entertainment industry and make sim similar claims that this is an industry that deserves some unique attention. So on the financing side of movies, there is a whole new way of financing films where the studios are becoming more of marketing arms and the financing is going outside the studio system. In terms of the accounting or the intellectual property rights and what's happening overseas with piracy, these are all really important issues, business issues that are unique to creative industries where you have intellectual property and you have experiences. And at Emmy, what we're trying to do is uh, study these in a more rigorous fashion on the academic side, try to disseminate this information to the entertainment industry, and trying to uh, allow students to really engage their own creativity in looking at the industry with new business plans, new business models, and trying to develop leaders for the future in entertainment.